Welcome to another edition of Hometown Happenings. I'm Supervisor George Homan. Thanks for joining us. We've got a great uh, panel of guests today. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm glad that you can join us for this special edition of Hometown Happenings. We're calling it Faith Matters. And we brought in three religious leaders from our community here in Clarkstown. I'm delighted to have them all join us. Let me introduce them uh, one by one. We have Rabbi Paul Curlin from the uh, Nanuet Hebrew Center. We have Reverend Richard Hasselback, the pastor of the Clarkstown Reformed Church. And we have Abdul Salim Mohammed, the Imam at the um, Islamic Center of Rockland County, located down in Valley Cottage. Welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. So um, in light of COVID, we thought that it would really be um, a great opportunity for us to have a special show with some of our religious leaders in the town of Clarkstown to really give a, a state of the union, if you will, as we go into the new year 2021 and really look at um, some of the important things that are facing our community. And I think there can be nothing more important than not just the physical well-being of people, but the spiritual and emotional well-being of people. And how best to get a real read on that, except through uh, some of the uh, houses of worship and some of the religious leaders. So really my first question um, I'm going to offer to each of our panel members is, um, how is um, your congregation faring uh, in light of uh, COVID and how you worship? Uh, Rabbi Curlin, why don't you start us off? So I have to honestly tell you that uh, answering that question is not easy because there is a little bit more disconnect from many of our congregants. Uh, there are those that come on to, uh, to Zoom. We have a number of uh, Zoom gatherings from studies to different services uh, that we do together. But there are others that don't connect that way. Um, and so that I'm not always sure exactly how everyone is doing. Now that we are significant number of months down the road, people have relatively adapted, meaning that they've gotten used to the new normal. Doesn't mean that they love it. They're still eager for this pandemic to end, but uh, they've learned how to adapt and how to find ways to uh, connect to the community. Um, still, I have to deal with those who are going through um, enormous emotional challenges, those who miss uh, things that are so simple as, as a hug um, and not being able to do that and, and to realize that even after the pandemic, hugs may be a thing of the past. Uh, they may not be so easy to, to receive. And uh, so, so my answer very simply is for those that I know that need my assistance, I'm willing to be there for them. But so many others can easily fly under the radar. And um, I have to hope and pray that somebody else finds out that they need my help so I can reach out to them. And, and Rabbi, uh, about how many people do, uh, do you think are joining you by streaming services by a, a percentage, uh, you know, in terms of the things that you're doing? So our, we usually have an evening service that's about 20 minutes long every night, Sunday through Thursday. And usually when we were in-house, there might be an average of about uh, 12, 13 people. Now that number is usually doubled. Um, so there's more people that come in. There's still not a large percentage of the community, but there are more people that come in there. Friday night services also are better attended by those that come in on Zoom. We are in-house also, but we limit it to it's usually about 12, 14 people in a room that fits 271, according to the fire code. So um, there are more that are coming in that way. My class on Monday morning has around the same number that I would get when we were in the house. And the, uh, that's, I'm sorry, that's on Monday morning. And the Saturday morning service, though, I will tell you honestly, I see less people on Zoom than I used to see in-house. Um, so it's still not the largest percentage of the uh, community. 
but, um, but we're out there welcoming them in whenever they're willing and able to join us. So, uh, Reverend Hasselback, maybe you could uh, give us a perspective. I know we were, we've been talking offline uh, before, and uh, you've, seen a, you've seen an increase as well in, in um, online worship. We have. Uh, I, I was telling someone uh, recently that we've been, uh, we're no strangers to social distancing. We've been doing it for about 50 years. Um, but, but what the pandemic has caused us to do, what's forced us to do, is to think outside the box, to, to begin to find new ways to reach people who otherwise we wouldn't have reached. So it gets us out of the sanctuary and really into the wider world in a different way that I could never have anticipated, but here we are. We, um, like, like Paul's uh, synagogue, we're reaching far more people now at each of our services than we could have ever reached um, if we were just doing in-church services, which we don't do anymore. We're, we're very concerned that we have an elderly uh, congregation. We're very concerned about their health, and I think part of caring for them spiritually is caring for them physically, caring, caring about their, their, their physical well-being. So we don't want to take any risks with them. And my thinking is, why bring them back into a, a, a church service where I'd be saying, okay, now sit, sit at least 10 feet apart and wear your masks, and we're going to take your temperature on the way in. Um, and we're, we're going to have music, but all the singers are going to be masks. We're not, but we're not going to have as much music because some of our singers don't want to come because they're afraid of spreading the virus or catching it themselves. So it's going to be a scaled down service. Why do that when we have a beautiful online service that we provide every, every Sunday and, and, and that um, it really is reaching, we're re now we're reaching people in, in Saskatoon, Canada, believe it or not, um, and, and in places in the mid Midwest and uh, along the East Coast from Florida up to Maine. So uh, the, the pandemic has forced us to do something differently but I'm not sure if, if we're not even being more effective because of what it's forced us to do. And, and uh, Reverend, I think you would also indicate it off camera that it's about triple the, the number of people online. Oh yeah, online. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. We have, we have uh, far more people coming and attending our online services than we ever had in church. So, so it, 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 and, and people who, who, who are attending love it because they're able to, um, to, to be in their living rooms, be in a comfortable, safe place with the people they love and live with. Uh, at the same time, what, what do we miss? We're missing out on, as, as Paul said, the, the physical contact. We're, we're missing out on being together um, in one place and touching, hugging, talking, things like that. Uh, we, we end up doing that on the Zoom call, not the touching and the hugging, but certainly the talking. Um, so it, it's, it's not perfect, and, and as, as we move into what will become the new normal, because I don't think we're ever going back to the old normal, uh, we're going to have to find a way to combine our online presence and, and the quality of that online presence and the reach of that online presence uh, with, um, with a, 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 a way to create physical community with people in a meaningful way. I'd like to add, if I can. can that I believe that after the pandemic, uh, most houses of worship will continue with the live streaming, Zoom, et cetera, so that they can connect to even more people. I also wanted to throw in that one of the things we're missing is after every Saturday morning service when we're in house, there's always a luncheon. We call it the Kiddush. And, um, and I once learned well over 40 years ago that what happens after the service is just as important as what happens during the service. The interaction with another, the sense of being part of, a, of an extended family. And um, so we look forward to that opportunity to have even more connections. But is, as Rich said, um, there are some blessings that we've received. Um, through technology, which has been helpful to all of us. Now, uh, Imam uh, Mohammed, uh, maybe you could give us a perspective on how uh, COVID has impacted the Islamic Center in, in your worship. Are you finding um, a decline in how are you handling services and uh, prayers at, uh, at the Islamic Center of Rockland? Yeah, uh, we are following the uh, state guideline, guideline and SOP, like six feet distance when we perform the prayer so uh, and uh, everyone you know we announce everyone come to mosque 
uh, with with mask and also uh, with their own rug so they come to uh, our mosque uh, with their own rug and also everybody you know pray with uh, six feet distance and uh, uh, in Islam you know when we meet each other we greeting and also we sh uh, shaking hand so we uh, we uh, told them to don't shake hand because of COVID-19 and also you know uh, some somebody is monitoring on the door uh, somebody is monitoring the temperature on the door so we follow the SOP and um, are you finding um, um, a decline in, in the number of people that are coming or is it is yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we allow just 30 percent capacity of mask uh, we have a capacity like around 400 uh, something so we allow just only uh, 100 or 130 you know so, um, so certainly, we're, we're, it sounds like uh, the state of, uh, of services within your houses of worship is, is probably indicative of, of what I've been hearing from others, uh, you know, in the area and certainly uh, what we're seeing in the news that um, uh, going to online, there's, um, there's actually um, a decent number of folks uh, that are coming, but uh, but really everybody's being safe and not, either not having services in person or reduced. And that's really kind of been the state, uh, state of affairs uh, throughout COVID. Um, you know, I want to kind of pivot to, um, uh, to this whole notion of, of one of the things that we're seeing um, across the country. There's been a, uh, indeed across the world, there's been a number of studies. The Pew Research Center um, has, um, uh, has done an, an awful lot of work in terms of um, looking at religious affiliation and religious practice. And one of the things that uh, came out in a study in, in um, 2019 and again uh, in October of this year, that the largest number, according to the Pew Research, or the largest growing segment in our population is this group called the nuns, uh, N-O-N-E-S. And that's uh, folks that are uh, not affiliated uh, with any particular religion or any particular institution. Uh, and I wanted to kind of get uh, your thoughts on, you know, um, that phenomenon. Uh, first of all, uh, do you think that's accurate? And uh, what do you think the implications are, you know, for that, for our country and for our community going forward? Uh, why don't we start with Reverend Hasselbeck? Yeah, um, I certainly think it's accurate. I mean, the, the numbers are down, um, at least in, in this country and, and certainly in our, in our church. Uh, but I don't think uh, that indicates that religion is less vibrant. I think it may indicate that we need to find new ways of reaching the people who still have spiritual hungers. I mean, there, there's, there's a longing for something more than just, just what the world offers, I think. And, and that w longing gets more and more intense as we get older, uh, which is why I think we, in churches and, and, and synagogues, actually have, uh, often have older congregations. But, but there's, there's this yearning in the human spirit for something more. Uh, St. Augustine, uh, in his confessions, wrote, Our hearts are restless, Lord, until they rest in you. And I've always heard that line as being indicative of the longing of the human spirit for something infinite. A and if the human spirit longs for something infinite, nothing finite will satisfy us. That means no cars, no jobs, no wealth, no 401ks, nothing but the infinite, nothing but a relationship with God can satisfy the soul. And I think that is what religion has and must offer in meaningful ways to the people who turn to us to find something more in their life than just what they see around them. And if we don't offer it, they will look someplace else. And, and um, hopefully they will find it in other churches, other synagogues that are offering a genuine relationship or a path to a genuine relationship with the Almighty. Uh, Rabbi, you want to add anything to that? Or, um... Yeah, I think that every generation, every century, there have always been new challenges. And uh, you needed to come up with a new paradigm uh, in terms of engaging people. I know that uh, when there was that large influx of Jews coming to the United States from 1880 to 1920, a great immigration period. Um, there were many who lived in those, those closed-up communities in Europe, the shtetl, 
that when they got on the boat, there are stories of those that threw all their religious objects overboard um, because they were coming to America and the freedom and the same way that people might reject or in the beginning reject some of their religious practices. Um, what happened is that in America, the, the synagogues um, adapted to try to gradually, I would say, woo them back in. And we did create the structure of the synagogues in the 20th century that worked. In the 21st century, we need a new paradigm. And the younger generation are not affiliating with anything the way that their parents or grandparents affiliated. They are not um, just signing up for cable, let's say. Um, they're choosing, do you want a little Hulu? You want a little Netflix? You want a li and they're, they're choosing from the different columns, column A, column B, column C, rather than taking all three in a package. So I think we need to engage in new ways because uh, to piggyback on what Rich said so beautifully, um, I believe that the human soul needs to nurture its spiritual side. Yes, we are part of the animal kingdom, but what elevates us above is the soul aspect. And if we only nurture our bodies and neglect our souls, somewhere down the road, we're going to feel that lack and we're going to feel the need to reconnect. And hopefully the churches and the synagogues and the, and, and the mosques will be there um, for people when, well, I will put it better. We will be there for people when they need us. We will also try in different ways to reach out so that they know that we are here for them. So, can I, can I back on just one thing that Paul said because it, it, it resonates with me. It, it, the word religion itself is from two Latin words, religio, religare, which means to reconnect. So genuine religion reconnects us with that which is most fundamental in our lives. It, 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 if, if we are to be faithful, to our call as religious leaders and churches and synagogues and mosques, then we are offering people a path to reconnection. We don't divide, we don't separate, we reconnect people to what's deepest within themselves. And when they find what's deepest within themselves, they will also find their commonality with everyone else because where we are most ourselves, we are no longer only ourselves. Thank you for that. And um, absolutely um, a very uh, interesting and um, uh, important perspective. Uh, Iman Mohammed, maybe you could uh, offer uh, some characterization on this. How, how do you reach uh, people and how do you attract people to come to the mosque? Yeah, we, we have a uh, five uh, times a daily prayer so people know, you know, uh, so so uh, we, we pray five times a daily like early in the morning so people know that so they, they come to prayer on time uh, and also you know uh, we send the emails uh, for a special programs for a special events and uh, also we have a evening Quran class so uh, we uh, you know I teach uh, my students from 4 to uh, 7.30 yeah. And uh, you are, certainly are an active uh, community probably one of the uh, faster growing uh, religious communities within uh, within Rockland County and certainly within our town. You know, I want to pivot, uh, if you will. We're talking about, um, you know, the role of religion, I guess, and really the role of faith in, in one's life. And uh, there was a very interesting um, uh, study that was recently done uh, that really talks about faith in crisis. And um, maybe we could kind of pivot to that. You know, why do you think it's important for people in a time of crisis such as we're in now, COVID, COVID-19, um, and in times of crisis, why do people uh, seek God? Why do people uh, look for religion? And why is it important for people to have some connection with the divine or the other? Uh, let's go to uh, uh, Rabbi Carlin on this. Oh, of course you could just start with me. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's never an easy question. Um, the discussion about uh, God is always a challenge because you have those people that say, I'm not sure I believe or not. And very often I will teach my congregants that um, I cannot prove to them 100%, let's even go beyond that, 1,000% that 
that there's a God out there. I'll honestly say that, and I believe that every religious leader would say there have to be moments of doubt. But I tell my congregants, I live my life as if there is a God, meaning I am so deeply comforted, I do believe in God, but I'm so deeply comforted by the guidance that religion gives me so that my interaction with others on this planet is a more blessed interaction. That it, it allows people to bring the best of themselves out because religion reminds us of the paths that we could be following and we should be following so that, again, the interaction with our neighbors, the interaction with all others is more blessed, um, more respectful, more understanding, and let's even say it simply more beautiful. Now, Reverend Hasselbeck, you know, why should people look for God in times of crisis? Well, and if I could again bounce off Paul's uh, comments a bit, uh, um, Carl Jung, the, the, the great really pioneering psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, was asked towards the end of his life in, a, in an interview on the BBC, um, the interviewer said, Dr. Jung, do you believe in God? And Jung's psychology has, was full of, of, uh, of, of spiritual pathways and images. And, um, and, and Jung, Jung looked at the camera, as I am looking now, and he said, no. He said, I don't believe. I know. I know there's a God. Here, at the end of his life, this brilliant man who was a polymath and, uh, and a pioneer, he had no doubt that he had seen enough of the handprints of God in, in the world and in his life to not think but know that God exists. And I'll agree with him that um, I've seen enough too. And why do people turn to God? Why do they need to turn to God even if they haven't? Why is, why is, is, is that, that faith in God so, so vibrant and, and valuable? It's because God gives meaning where we think there is none. And if we, if we approach um, God prayerfully, if we approach God using the tools of our, of our, our tradition, the, the, the Bible and, 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 and the spiritual pathways uh, like meditation, um, then we will find, I think, meaning where others find no meaning. We will find hope where others find uh, reasons to despair. We'll find ways to connect. What, what does religion do? Again, relig religare. It reconnects us, and, and genuine religion is going to find us pathways to reconnect with each other, whether or not we're social distanced. So, so the, the value of religion in times of crisis is that it gives us enough meaning and enough hope to, to move on through it and to find, <coughs> excuse me, to find the goodness that lies at the heart of things, all things, not just good things, all things. And um, uh, Imam Muhammad, um, why is it important for people to believe in God, and to believe in Allah? Because, uh, uh, because uh, he is our creator, the God is our creator. So we have to believe him and also we have to worship him. Uh, and, uh, you know, in difficult time, when we remember uh, God uh, in uh, and deeply like with the heart so uh, God always you know help us and protect us from the hardship thank you so um, very beautiful um, uh, perspective that you each shared you know um, it, it kind of reminds me um, again in preparing uh, preparing for this uh, show there was a study that uh, came out uh, actually an article that um, back in April and uh, if you just uh, put yourself back in time if you remember early on in the COVID crisis um, there was um, uh, the real fear about ventilators and if would we have enough ventilators uh, in hospitals and there was uh, quite a bit of discussion that was taking place about um, uh, who who would qualify and and were we going to run out of ventilators and thankfully we didn't but uh, there was actually a study that was published in a news report uh, and it really uh, looked at the question of prioritizing uh, medical treatment 
based upon um, uh, based upon um, uh, people's background, and um, and they actually found, and it, and it was really interesting when I came across this recently. They actually found that um, amongst uh, folks that are more religiously oriented, uh, there was really um, um, in folks that were affiliated uh, with houses of worship or uh, practicing religion, uh, that um, they, they really, folks were not willing to prioritize um, in terms of who should get it. And it really came down to uh, the ones that were the most utilitarian, if you will, um, you know, were really, um, uh, and, you know, the ones that were not religiously connected, uh, felt that um, only people that had a better chance of survival should receive ventilators. And I think it's kind of indicative of, um, of you know, that kind of divide that we're seeing. So really, you know, if there really is a decline in religious affiliation, um, what do you think some of those implications are going to be for our community and for our country going forward? And we'll go with Reverend Hasselback to start this one. That's a wonderful question. And, and it, it, it resonates with something I read just yesterday in the papers, which is uh, the, the problem that we're about to face with prioritizing who should get vaccines as they begin to, to, to come out. Um, I, I think a religious faith would, would suggest that, that we allocate the resources of medicine and any scarce resources uh, in a way that's most fair uh, to the people who are most in need. So uh, I, I think what, what faith would say is, at least what, what, I'm, what I would hear in our faith, is that uh, in allocating any resources, ventilators, vaccines, you name it, we look for the people who, who benefit the most and are most at risk because every human being is made in the image of God. And so every human life is precious. It's precious from the beginning to the end of life, from conception to natural death. And, and, and through all of that period of time, uh, I, I think we as people of faith, or at least I, I would say as a, a person of faith, I need to ask of those who control resources uh, to, to honor the humanity and the dignity of every person, regardless of race, regardless of faith, regardless of age, uh, purely on the basis of who is most at risk, who is most at need, and how can we best save lives and help people. Rabbi, you have anything to add? Um, it's very hard to add to what Rich just said because he said it so beautifully. Uh, the reality is that these are always, I would almost even say, impossible issues to deal with. That there's no perfect solution. But um, I will just, again, we're really good at piggybacking today. I will say that the respect for every human life is an imperative. And, um, and, and there's nothing else I can add except for the fact that I will turn to Rich and say ditto. Thank you. And, and I would think, uh, Iman, obviously you, you would agree that uh, respect for, for human life and, and equality is, is something that's uh, so important that religion really kind of gives us that, that basis to, to, to uh, have as a common point to realize that uh, there is an equality in the eyes of God with all of us and, and therefore uh, we need to respect one another. Yes. So uh, I want to pivot to the, the CARES unit. This is something that I'm um, very proud of here in the town of Clarkstown that uh, we put together in 2018 after some of the horrific attacks that took place, uh, the shooting in Pittsburgh, uh, some of the attacks that took place uh, over in uh, Europe in some of the mosques. Uh, and uh, it was really an effort and an attempt uh, by the town through the police department to identify and to work closely with our religious and, and cultural institutions within the town of Clarkstown. And, um, and the CARES unit, um, as we'll see momentarily in the clip that we're going to play, uh, really is, um, is an, a, an effort and an attempt uh, to, uh, uh, to reach out to houses of worship and to make sure that they're safe, but also to make sure that they're um, um, 
uh, receiving the support that they need and that they have the resources in place to make sure that they're safe and the people can gather there safely. So we'll watch that clip and then we'll come back and talk about the CARES unit. Well, the CARES or the Cultural and Religious Security Unit uh, began in 2018 uh, after the Tree of Life Synagogue shooting in Pittsburgh. Uh, the supervisor, uh, George Homan, and the chief of police, uh, Ray McCullough, uh, felt that uh, the community could probably benefit from a specific unit that um, deals with cultural and religious targets that tend to be a lot softer and a lot less secure. Uh, the community uh, has embraced it uh, better than we had expected. Uh, we have reached out and uh, gotten uh, in touch and made uh, contact with more than 50 um, religious, cultural, and uh, faith-based organizations within the town and uh, they have all or many of them have taken advantage of some of the things that uh, that we provide completely free of charge. Some of the things that we do, some of the some of the, the ways that we reach out to our cultural and, and religious partners within the community uh, is that we provide safety audits for those organizations but in addition uh, we provide active shooter cards and active shooter training. We provide stop the bleed training which is completely free of charge. All of these free of charge uh, we're currently uh, in the process of uh, dealing with um, cybersecurity, which has become increasingly uh, important, uh, especially with uh, COVID, and many congregations reaching out and dealing with their services and uh, their, their meetings online. My unit uh, consists of uh, myself and uh, my immediate supervisor, Sergeant Alice Lachette, and five additional officers. Uh, I get Our officers get extensive training in, in, in a variety of cultures, uh, and religious uh, organizations. Uh, they also are trained in various uh, security for religious and, and faith-based institutions and cultural institutions. Uh, that training is constantly ongoing, constantly evolving, and um, that's how we, we manage to stay, stay current with uh, what's currently going on. This is unique uh, to Clarkstown, to Rockland County, and to the tri-state area. There are uh, not, to my knowledge, there are no other units that do anything similar to what we do. And uh, based on our large and diverse religious, cultural, and, and ethnic populations, uh, something that uh, we felt was needed to be done and, and needed to be uh, an important part of our, our policing, uh, community policing outreach. Okay, so um, Rabbi Curlin, maybe we'll start with you, uh, with the CARES unit, Lieutenant Chernick, and uh, the level of communication. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your experience uh, as the rabbi over at the Nanuet Hebrew Center with the CARES unit and working with the Clarkstown Police Department. Um, they have absolutely been a blessing to us. Um, feeling as if we are being uh, supported and, um, and protected. Uh, Steve has been absolutely wonderful. I have members of my congregation who were on a special committee that communicated with him regularly and I've been able to just pick up the phone and call him and, and ask him a number of questions. We are in a location which is not far off of the Palisades Parkway and we're also on one of the major roads in Clarkstown which is Little Tor Road uh, which means there's a lot more traffic that goes past our building all of the time. Um, the police um, uh, cruisers are very often sitting in our parking lot uh, different times of day which just gives that sense of presence that we are being protected. Um, the holidays are always the most significant times and even though this last Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur we were not indoors the way that we were. We weren't there with 750 people we were there with 35 people in the room. Um, they were always driving by, always checking in, always making sure that everything um, was, was safe. Um, along with the fact that we, of course, hire um, um, security. Um, I do want to mention that when the Pittsburgh attack uh, took place, because we were in the midst of services and because I don't use technology on the Sabbath, um, I wasn't going to be aware of it and I really feel blessed way back when when in fact you, George, came to our synagogue to make sure that we were okay. And I know you went around to all of the synagogues in the area 
And those are the gestures that just gave us that sense of, of comfort. And we weren't in it alone. We had other levels of, of concern and protection. And I do want to thank Steve, especially at this time, for always being there. And again, as I said, always answering my phone calls if I have them. I know one of the things, and thank you for that, Rabbi, one of the things that was important, uh, that horrific attack in, in Pittsburgh, uh, Chief McCall and I uh, immediately got together and, and went to all the synagogues. And, and it's, um, it was, and I didn't even really think about it, um, um, but we were kind of breaking the news. Nobody knew in any of the synagogues what had taken place. Um, and so not only were we going to check and make sure everybody was okay, but, you know, frankly, we were the bearers of that horrific news and it, it prompted the chief and I to talk about what can we do and what should we be doing because these attacks on houses of worship across the world and even in our country um, are becoming more frequent and it doesn't break down just uh, on one particular religious denomination. We've had attacks in Pentecostal churches, we've had attacks in synagogues, we've had attacks in Catholic churches, we've had attacks in mosques and, um, and so around that time late 2018 there were a series of attacks over in Europe and the Clarkstown Police Department gets a lot of intel uh, we are sharers in the in the um, uh, in the Joint Terrorism Task Force we actually have a police officer assigned to that we work closely with the FBI and the NYPD we're, um, we do receive uh, briefings uh, from our federal authorities and so with the rise in anti-semitism the rise in, in hate crimes across the country uh, around the world, uh, we really felt it was incumbent on us to make sure that we did something. So hence the CARES unit was born, and, and uh, I'm proud to say they've done security audits uh, as, as well. And, and um, I believe Clarkstown and our houses of worship are a lot safer, and our cult cultural institutions as well uh, to their efforts. Uh, Iman Mohammed, I know we've done a lot of work with the Clarkstown Police Department. Okay. Over at um, over at your mosque, maybe you could speak a little bit about uh, the relationship with the Clarkstown Police as it relates to your mosque. Yes, uh, they have uh, supported uh, supported us and they guide us, and uh, you know uh, on site they they gave us training. You know how to uh, protect if someone come with the gun inside the mosque, and also you know we deal. Uh, with the with the Steve, you know, Steve is uh, our friend. So, so th thank you for that. And I know that um, that's just an ongoing relationship. It's not just, and people uh, in the town need to know, it's not just that we have police cruisers in the parking lot, but uh, we've looked at, we have detailed uh, plans of the building, we've helped to formulate security plans, and we work closely with the leadership of these houses of worship. Reverend Hasselbeck, maybe you could speak uh, to your relationship with the Clarkstown Police Department at the Clarkstown Reform Church. Yeah, and, and uh, again, to piggyback on, on both the Imam and, and, and uh, Paul, the churches are very vulnerable. Um, we're, 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 when we're open, we're open to everybody. We don't, we don't screen people on the way in. So we're at the mercy of the people who, who arrive. Uh, and the, uh, the CARES unit has been tremendous. They have been uh, proactive. They reach out to us. Uh, the, I, I see the uh, the cruisers not only on special occasions, but they 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 are around a lot, um, and they're just a presence that keeps us safe. And we are tremendously appreciative of them, of Steve Chernick, um, of the police force in general. These guys are heroes, and uh, and at a time when uh, police folks in general are coming under some attack by other uh, by other uh, s sections of of the nation uh, i think it's important for us to realize that these guys are, are out there they're putting their lives on the line and they're keeping us safe and we in 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 the clark center reform church are tremendously appreciative of everything they do well, thank you for that and uh, maybe we could pivot we only have a couple of minutes left so i'd, I'd really like to go uh, now to what the future holds. So we're filming this a couple of days before Christmas in 2020. It'll be airing in, in early 2021. And um, we're in a time when vaccines are coming out, uh, when people are starting to get vaccinated, although the belief really is, and from what we're being told, and as we're working with the Department of Health and with the state and with the federal government, 
Um, you know, we're probably not going to have uh, the vaccine out to the general public and all the members of the general public that want it until probably sometime between April and, and June of next year. So at risk people at first. So we're probably going to still be in this period in the beginning of 2021 of, of still Zoom meetings and more remote type uh, encounters. Um, what does the future hold for, for you, Rabbi, over in, um, in the Nanuit Hebrew Center in terms of eventually going back to in person? And, and what do you think things are going to look like, the new reality for you with your worship services in um, 2021? First of all, we all pray for the end of the pandemic. We, we pray for the ability to uh, regather in larger numbers and not have to social distance. And God willing, that day will come and will come soon. Um, I still think that there will be those people who, who would rather be better safe than sorry. And therefore, they may stay away from larger crowds. Um, so that only time will tell exactly what will happen. Um, I do know that there are so many that are just so eager to be part of that, as I mentioned before, that extended family and to feel that sense of closeness and support and, and love that's shared with one another. So I do believe that once we have the ability to reopen in a, we'll say that whatever that new normal is, um, I believe that there'll be a large influx of people coming into the building um, just to feel that sense of community. Um, but, there, but again, um, we don't know what that new normal is going to be. And, and, I, and I can't look into the future. I'm very much interested in trying to, to, desi to design something, but um, there's too much of an unknown. Um, so it's, it's a waiting game but we're still out there and we're still giving uh, the best shot at trying to connect people right now so that when that time does come, they already feel a relationship. I do want to add one thing. There are some new faces that we've met on Zoom and they've become part of the community. Because we're using Zoom and all the faces are, are able to be seen by everyone else, We've gradually gotten to know those people, but I look forward to that day where we walk into the building and they say, oh, you are so-and-so. It, it was nice to meet you on Zoom, but it's even nicer to meet you in person. And I look forward to those kind of uh, stronger connections between people happening, and as I've said a million times, happening very soon. And uh, Reverend Hasselbeck, how about uh, Clarkson Reform Church? When do you think you'll go back to in person and and what do you think the future holds? How will things be different for you? Well, we're going to be very cautious about going back to in-person worship, uh, in, in part because I don't want to put anybody at risk, and in part because what we're doing now online is, is very effective. So, so when, when the new normal occurs, what, where, where, where are we going to change and how are, going to remain, how are we going to remain the same? We're going to change, and we will, we will be creating space for... Uh, f for for fellowship, for togetherness, for for uh, what Paul talks about when he talks about that that need that people have to to touch, to to hug, to to be together. So that's that's a, that's a hunger that people have, and w we'll create a space for that. Uh, but we're also going to stay online. We, we've learned a lot about um, uh, about the power of the internet, the power of of of, of projecting our our services to. To, uh, onto a platform where, where they're available to more people who can hear our voice and, and, and hopefully be moved by it. So, so the new normal for us is going to be a continued effort um, to, to reach out using the tools of technology uh, and to be effective with the, with the Christian message. We, we just hired a, a director of, of new media and media outreach at the church so that we can really uh, begin to do more things like podcasts and, and, uh, and, and more online uh, educational opportunities, present more on online educational opportunities for, for folks. So, so the new normal is going to be uh, something old and something new. Uh, it's going to be fellowship, but it's also going to be uh, an internet presence. And when we get back into church for services, um, we will be live streaming them, and, and hopefully they will be even more beautiful than they were before. And uh, Imam Mohammed, uh, how, uh, how will things be different when, uh, as we go into 2021 with your worship services over at the mosque? 
Can you repeat that question? So um, how, when do you expect to have more people coming back to the mosque and will you do things differently uh, over at the mosque as the pandemic ends? Yeah, we hope God's mercy, you know, uh, one day this uh, COVID-19 will be end uh, by the uh, mercy of God. So uh, uh, we will see, uh, you know, if uh, the situation is good, then we will allow the all people to come and uh, come to mosque and pray together, you know. So we, we all look forward to that day when, when you know, we can get people back to whatever the new normal is going to be. So I, I do want to thank uh, each, of, each of my guests today. And um, uh, Rabbi uh, Curlin, maybe you could just give your contact information if anybody's interested in following up with you directly. And, and I should have asked this earlier, but Rabbi, how long have you been at, at uh, the Nanuit Hebrew Center? And, and how long have you been a rabbi? So... Um, I arrived in 1997, Nanuet Hebrew Center, when they were actually in Nanuet, um, where the stop and shop is in uh, Nanuet. Um, and so this is my 23rd year with the uh, congregation. I actually went to rabbinical school when I was an old man at the age of 29. How many of you remember the age of 29? And, um, and I didn't plan on going into the pulpit. So my first full-time pulpit work, I mean, I worked as an educational director, so in some ways that was even an assistant rabbi position uh, for a number of years. But um, Nanuit Hebrew Center was my first full-time uh, pulpit, that I was the senior rabbi and, and I was the only rabbi in the synagogue at the time. Uh, my contact is, we are, of course, on Little Tour Road in uh, New City and right off of the Palisades Parkway, exit 10. Um, my email, if anyone needs to reach out to me, is rabbi at nanuethc.org. And it's easy if you go online and look for our website to find the phone numbers as well. I don't think I have to give that out at this point. But we're always available, and, and it, you do not have to be Jewish to have a question that you want to call and ask the rabbi about. I've had so many contacts from sometimes college students that are doing a paper for one of their classes and they need to know more about Judaism. So any questions you have would be great. I do want to share with you something I shared with, uh, with Rich before we uh, started uh, filming today. Um, I know of one younger rabbi, and when the time comes that we can gather like this, that sits in a Starbucks with a sign at, at the table saying, I'm a rabbi, if you have any questions, come and ask me. So Rich and I thought that maybe we would hang out in the future in a Starbucks and saying, we are some of the Clarkstown clergy, come ask us any questions you want. So maybe that's an opportunity to connect to us as well in the future. Rich, are we going to do that? Amen, okay. as we say in the business. I've heard that before. <laughs> so, uh, Rev Reverend Hasselbeck, how, how long have you been uh, uh, at the Clarkstown Reformed Church? I know this is your... Your second time This there is my pastor. second time around. I was, I was there first in 2010 to 2014, then I went down to Florida, uh, but they asked me to come back in 2018, so I've been back, and, and my, my psychiatrist and I are working on why I did this. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, I've been back since 2018. Love it. I mean, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful community Could of great the people. number of your psychiatrists, by the way? Yes, I can. So, I'll, okay, I'll be happy you. to share it with you. <laughs> but um, we... Uh, the, uh, I, the, uh, the contact number for the church is, if you're, if you're interested in our, um, in our services or at c contacting us, the, the website is crcwestnyack.org. And there you can find the Sunday service, you can find our YouTube channel, uh, you can find all sorts of other stuff that we're doing. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun place to go. And my, and my email is rev, rev rich, R E V R I C H at mac.com and like paul call i mean you don't have to be in the reformed church to ask a question just like you don't have to be a jewish to ask ask paul a question or to love levy rye bread and and when we go to that starbucks to answer questions we are going to have a sign that says rabbi pastor we are not a joke we are here to answer questions. <laughs> we might be a joke. We might be a joke too, that's right. <laughs> that's for you to find out down the line. That's for you to judge. I, 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 um, I refrained actually from, from offering a joke about a, a, 
a pastor and a rabbi and an imam walk into town hall. You know, um, I, didn't, I really couldn't find a good punchline, yeah. but, but certainly it was a, a great opportunity. I, imam Mohammed, how long have you been at the mosque, and um, and what what's your contact information if people want to get in, in contact with you? Uh, since the uh, last six years, uh, I'm Imam in Islamic Center of Rockland. So my email address is ma underscore salim, S A L E E M 12 at yahoo.com. If anyone has a question about Islam or about uh, anything, you know, uh, we, we inshallah will answer them. Uh, so. So th thank you all so very much. Uh, this re has really been a, a very different program for us, but I thought it was important uh, to be able to kind of give a, a state of, of, the, of, of the world, if you will, in our own little corner of the world here in Clarkstown. And how better to do it than from some of the important religious leaders that we have here in the town of Clarkstown. A rabbi, a pastor, and an imam from our Islamic Center uh, to really kind of give their unique perspective on the state of affairs. So until next time, thanks for joining us. I'm Supervisor George Holman. Take care.